He specializes in the treatment of sleep disorders in children and adults at Stanford since 1993. He's lectured nationally and internationally on sleep disorders. He's done multiple television, radio, and print interviews. He is originally from New York City, where he attended medical school and completed training in child neurology. He has served as chair of the Sleep Disorders Research Advisory Board of the National Center for Sleep Disorders Research at the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute at the NIH. He chaired the Pediatric Special Interest Section of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. Along with Dr. William DeMent, he teaches the Stanford Sleep and Dreams course to hundreds of undergraduate students. Together, they co-authored the course textbooks. So we're really in for a treat. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Palaio. Thank you. What was the name of the last method in the last lecture? What was it? I never heard of it before. Had you guys heard of it before? No, you had. Some of you had. I never heard of it before. But you guys have heard of sleep, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You got it right. So I was like, okay, this will be interesting. Um, you heard a lot about pediatrics in my background. I work with kids and adults. I actually see more adults than kids. I like taking care of families because if one person in the family doesn't sleep, well, it affects other members of the family, right? It makes sense to you. Um, so. I know that there's also a chance for you to sign up for research. Um, just want to let you guys know, we have a, a project. There's a medication development that will give you the effect of, feel, of feeling like you've only slept. It'll, it'll make you feel like you've slept eight hours, but you only have to sleep four. So we have this thing going. You're going to feel like you've slept eight, but you only need four hours of sleep. Anybody want to take it? Anybody want to volunteer? <laughs> Nobody even asked the side effects. <laughs> Private parts can fall off. You don't care. Right? I mean, I want, you to know, I want you to think about sleep a little. We don't have such a thing. It's never going to happen. We're not going to get rid of sleep. Okay? You, we have to sleep. The question is, why do we sleep? Uh, one of the early sleep researchers said, if sleep has no function, it's the b biggest mistake evolution ever made. Right? Because think about it. It's kind of odd if you think about it. Like, why do we sleep? What's going on? So I'm going to talk to you guys about sleep and how it affects our lives. Let me, I'll, I'll change slides every now and then. Normal sleep. What can go wrong, how to fix it, and some Q&A. Now, I think that the way you sleep is a reflection of your life, and your life is reflecting the way you sleep. It goes in both directions, okay? So in reality, even though I, I work in a sleep clinic, I don't take care of sleep problems. I take care of people who are awake who feel that the way they feel when they're awake is attributed to their sleep, right? So it is, goes in both directions. Little kids, this happens a lot, right? And if some person doesn't sleep well, it affects other people in the family. How many of you don't think you sleep well? Raise your hands. Okay. How many of you, uh, your partner sleeps fine? A lot of times you'll see you only get one insomniac per couple. You don't get two people. Insomniacs don't sleep with other insomniacs. They don't do that. Okay. In fact, you have to be sleep compatible. And I meet many people who say, well, they break up over this because if you don't sleep well, right, then the other person is going to sleep just fine. And if you sleep well, if you have an insomniac sleeping with you, you if, that's, if that's a light sleeper, you know you don't have to worry too much because that person will notice if anything goes wrong, right? And the difference becomes noticeable when you become parents, okay? Early on, any relationship, any couple here, you know, one of you sleeps lighter than the other early on, right? And over time, that difference becomes more marked. It really starts when you become parents. The, um, the one who's been identified as a deep sleeper, if they hear the baby cry, they, they open their eyes, they close them quickly and pretend they're sleeping and wait, <laughs> right? And the light sleeper knows this bum's not getting up, I might as well take care of it. And they become more vigilant. And over time, it becomes more and more marked. So we're going to talk about sleep as we go along. Many of you have pain, that's why we're here today. Um, it shouldn't be surprising anybody who has pain doesn't sleep well. This is one review I found on chronic pain. And they, they said that people who don't sleep, who have chronic low back pain, sleep less and sleep worse. Not a surprise. They also, more importantly, have trouble with how they feel the next day. Because if you didn't have to sleep, would you bother doing it? Think about when you travel. These days you spend more money on the hotel than you do on the airfare. Right? Right? You know, if you didn't have to sleep, would you do it? 
Okay, people tell me this all the time. Whenever I tell them I'm a sleep doctor, and, and I kind of keep it on the down low because right, people go pin me down, um, they always say things to me like, I love to sleep. That's my problem. I love to sleep. And it's like telling me you're fond of oxygen. It's not kind of a non thing to say that you love to sleep, right? Because we all have to sleep. We all have to do it. Um, but the real issue is not the sleeping. It's how you feel the next day. If you didn't have to sleep and feel fine, you wouldn't be concerned about it. It's because the thinking that tomorrow depends on how will I sleep tonight. Think about that. You ever find yourself thinking, tomorrow depends on how will I sleep tonight. I'll see how, how I do tomorrow depending on what happens tonight. If I sleep well, then I can do this. If I don't sleep well, then I can't do that. And if you think tomorrow depends on how will I sleep tonight... The only way you're going to know what you're going to do tomorrow is by monitoring how you sleep, which makes you sleep even lighter, which makes you sleep even worse. And you get caught in a vicious cycle. So whenever I hear about any complaint, I think of sleep in four dimensions. So anybody I see, child or adult, I think of sleep in these four dimensions. I think about the amount of sleep. And people often think about just that. Um, how many hours I sleep do I need? I hear that a lot. Parents ask that all the time. How many hours should my child sleep? What they're really asking is how many hours can they be away from that child? That's what they really want to know, right? <laughs> That's what they're asking. But the amount of sleep is not the issue. It's not just the issue. I saw a, a mom who said her three-year-old um, brought him in, and I asked the three-year-old, why are you here? And he told me, sleeping makes me tired. The three-year-old looked at me and goes, doctor, sleeping makes me tired. And the reason he said it, and the mother says, I'm perplexed. He sleeps more than other kids. He still naps. No matter what he does, he's still tired. And he was simple. He just had big tonsils. He couldn't breathe well. The more he slept, the worse he was going to feel because he couldn't breathe. But sleeping made him tired. So stop thinking about the hours of sleep. It doesn't matter. It's how you feel when you wake up. You should wake up feeling refreshed. If you don't wake up refreshed, something is wrong. You don't leave nice restaurants feeling hungry. You should not wake up be feeling tired. If you're tired, no matter how much you sleep, something is wrong. Don't think about the, quant the amount. Think about the quality. So the amount, the quality, the other part to this is the timing. When do you sleep and your state of mind? Okay? Do you look forward to going to sleep or sleeping a hassle? Right? A lot of people with sleep issues start dreading the night. They look at the bed and go, oh, here I go again. Do I take a pill or do I not take a pill tonight? Do I take half a pill? Do I leave the pill there for later? What if I run out? I'm not going to get any refills. How much is this thing going to cost anyway? <laughs> then I've got to call the doctor again. Then I've got to go to the house. I've got to make an appointment. Okay? You don't go to bed going to sleep. You go to bed to see what happens. <laughs> and that's messed up. You can't go to bed that way. You can't sleep well that way. Okay? So your, your, your state of mind. The timing issue is more about shift work or, and stuff like that. If you can go to bed whenever you want and sleep as much as you like, and you're still tired, something is wrong. Right? These are the common sleep disorders that we deal with, insomnia, sleep apnea. Um, there's a timer here, but it's not counting down. Can you let me know when I have uh, two or three minutes left? Thank you. These are things that we deal with at work on a regular basis. The fun thing about my job as a sleep doctor, almost everybody gets better. It's unusual for somebody not to improve. If you've got problems with your sleep, come talk to us. Come see us. We're in the same building that the pain clinic's in. You know, I woke up this morning thinking it's Sunday. I'm like, okay, oh, it's Sunday. I go, oh, I got to give a talk. My next thought was, what am I going to wear? <laughs> this is my next thought. And I thought, Dr. Mackey's going to wear a suit. Maybe he's even going to wear a tie. And I was in, I was in shorts and flip flops. I'm like, what do I do? I was like thinking about it. Like, I want to wear whatever. But like, I, but if you come see me at work, I'll wear a tie. I promise. Okay. <laughs> So people often say this, they want to sleep like babies, right? Have you ever said this phrase, I want to sleep like a baby? Do you really want to sleep like a baby? you really want to be incontinent? No. You don't want to be sleep like babies. <laughs> babies don't sleep that well at all. Babies sleep actually pretty bad, okay? Um, they don't sleep that great. Um, our best sleepers are eight and nine-year-olds. And I want you to think about how an eight or nine-year-old person sleeps and how that relates to you. Because your goal in life should be to sleep like an eight or nine-year-old person. Think about what was it like to be eight or nine years old. Eight or nine-year-old person, your life is a reflection of your sleep, and your sleep's reflected in your life. I said that earlier. Eight or nine-year-old person comes home from school, maybe has a snack, does a little bit of homework. They think they have lots of homework, but they really don't. They just think it's a lot of homework, right? Then they have dinner, finish up the homework. By the time they finish homework and have their, their meal, it's too late to go outside. You don't see a bunch of eight or nine-year-olds playing outside in the street at night. No. They're indoors. They spend time with their family. When you're eight or nine years old, you have a set bedtime. You could stay up later if they let you, but they don't, right? Right? The parents, you go to your room, the kids don't fight their bedtimes anymore. When they're eight or nine, they have the routine down. 
Eight or nine-year-old person, when they go to the room, parents say, good night, I love you, turn off the lights. When you're eight or nine years old, you do not worry about the mortgage or the rent. Safety of the house to take care for you. Somebody wakes up in time to go to school. Clothes are laid out for you. Somebody gives you breakfast. Somebody takes you to school. How well do eight or nine-year-old people sleep? Fall asleep easily, sleep through the night, wake up refreshed, run around all day, don't take naps, and on weekends, do eight and nine-year-old kids sleep in? No, right? Parents wish they would, but they don't. Eight and nine-year-olds get up and go. If anything, my generation was a chance to watch cartoons. They weren't on all the time, okay? So think about how that eight or nine-year-old person goes to sleep. They go to bed feeling safe, comfortable, and loved. They go to, state, they go to sleep in a state of serenity. You have to think about yourselves. How do you go to bed at night? Are you in a state of serenity? Or are you like, how bad will it be tonight? What's going to happen tomorrow? Okay? Reality is that your problems will wait for you tomorrow. You're going to have pain. You're in pain. It's, it's, not, it's unfortunate. But you're still going to have to deal with this tomorrow. The issue really is, is how not to create a separate issue with your sleep. That's what I'm talking to you more about now. To so understand this, you've got to think a little bit about the basics, the science behind this. What makes us sleep in the first place? As I said earlier, there's a paradox of sleeping, and people with sleep problems have, are caught in a paradox. Okay? The paradox of sleep is that we have to sleep for reasons that are not entirely clear. I'll talk a little bit more as we go on, but we have to sleep, but you're at risk of being attacked whenever you sleep. So the body must protect you while you're sleeping. And all animals that sleep protect themselves while they're sleeping, and we're no different. Some new science has come out about how the brain works in sleep. And it turns out that the spinal fluid in our brain circulates faster when we're sleeping than we're awake. And the thinking is, you know, if you think about the brain as an electrical organ, it's the brain that has to sleep, not your lungs, not your kidneys. It's your brain that has to sleep. And this electrical organ called the brain has waste products, and they actually get flushed out during sleep. So there's literally, you're washing your brains at night. That's what's really happening, Okay. And there's some new science behind this. This may be tied into Alzheimer's, for example, where the system may become impaired and metabolites and things that shouldn't be left behind get stuck in the brain and get left behind and start to inter interfere with how the brain works. They think about like your car's fuel. If it starts, the fuel tanks get sludge and junk in it. It just runs less efficiently. This idea that while we're sleeping, we can be attacked. All animals protect themselves while we're sleeping. And the example I always like to use is this simple one from dolphins. Some of you probably know this. But think about dolphins' world. Swim fast, avoid sharks, eat fish, breathe oxygen. How does a dolphin sleep? You guys know? Some of you must know. Half the brain at a time. One half sleeps, the other half stays awake. You were raising your hand, sir? I'm sorry. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Okay. But that's the point. The animal can swim and sleep at the same time. And actually, in the school, the ones on the outside have they coordinate which half the brain is, is on, so that because I only need to be looking over here if I'm in a school, I'm, I can sleep this half of the brain because I got a dolphin buddy next to me, and the other one, the other side is doing that. And birds that migrate do the same thing; they change positions based on how they're sleeping. Because bears that migrate also can sl and f can sleep and fly at the same time. How many of you would like to do that yourselves right now? Have the brain going on, right? So what about us? Okay, we're not swimming, we're not flying. We're, ter we're here. Humans do not sleep eight hours at a time. That's a common mistake. We sleep in spurts just like other, other animals do. It's a misconception to think you, you slept eight hours in a row. None of us have ever slept eight hours in a row. You never have and you never will. Humans only sleep about 90 minutes at a time. Every 90 minutes, all humans open their eyes, make sure everything's okay, close your eyes and go back to sleep. You don't remember it. All of you do it. Little kids, babies, every hour, if you watch them, if you come to the sleep lab, put wires on your head, we watch you, you'll see every hour they wake up, change positions, go back to sleep. Only for a few seconds. If you really slept eight hours in a row, wouldn't the lions and tigers figure that out and pull us out of our cave at 3 o'clock in the morning, right? We sleep in 90-minute spurts. We all do, okay? So every 90 minutes, we all wake up, make sure everything's okay, and we go back to sleep. That's how it goes. There are different kinds of sleep. You heard of dreaming sleep, REM sleep, right? Dreaming sleep is about two hours per night. All of us dream every night for about two hours, okay? And then there's this non-dreaming sleep, this deep sleep. That we'll, everybody who has pain issues will always talk about their deep sleep. But there's a kind of sleep I want to tell you about that often gets ignored in all these conversations about sleep, and that's called stage one, our lightest sleep, how we enter sleep. So we, in light stage one, fall asleep, 
Wake up briefly, fall back asleep, stage one. And we can do the cycle all night long. The thing about stage one sleep is you think you're awake when in fact you're asleep. Go to any monotonous conference, you can't believe the speaker's droning on and on. And you're going to look around the room, somebody's head nodding, eyes rolling, eyes closed, head drops. We've all seen it. If you nudge that person, what's the first thing they say? I'm awake. I'm resting my eyes. Right? They're asleep. Okay? No point in arguing you're asleep. When you have very light sleep, it feels like you're awake when, in fact, you're asleep. And that's what's happening with many of you who have pain problems. Your sleep is so light. You may think you're awake when, in fact, you're asleep. And sometimes, some of you, and some of you are nodding your heads already, um, your, the, your, your loved ones will say, oh, after lunch, you know, I ask a patient, do you, do you take a nap? Your loved ones say, oh, he, um, he goes to his favorite chair, and he says, I'm just resting my eyes. I'm resting. You hear them snoring. They still say they're resting. Okay? That's what happens because your sleep is so light, it feels unrefreshing. So please understand that you may be sleeping more than you realize. And people with sleep problems are trapped in misconceptions about their sleep. The most common misconception I hear, if I can't sleep, I should rest. And resting and sleeping are two different things. You cannot equate resting and sleeping. The dolphin is swimming and sleeping at the same time, Right? Resting and sleeping are two different things. If we get up and did 100 jumping jacks, I'm not doing any exercises with you guys. I'm like, right, I won't do that. But if we did 100, 100 jumping jacks, you might feel tired. You're not going to feel sleepy. And if you've ever been jet lagged, you know it's not the same being tired and being sleepy. So a common mistake that people do, especially people in pain, any kind of chronic disability, uh, any kind of chronic illness and problem, they'll spend more time in bed because they've got to rest. How do they measure the size of the hospital? How do they rank them? Number of beds. That's how they say it, right? You hang out in the bed right, all the time. Your body gets used to being awake um, instead of being in bed for sleeping. You give your body mixed signals. I'm here to sleep or I'm here to watch TV and eat and, and, and unwind, okay? Sleeping and resting is not the same thing. We actually want you to spend less time in bed. And if you spend less time in bed, when you do get a chance to sleep, you get back in bed, your body will sleep deeper. If I want to make you sleep deeper, I have you, have you spend less time in bed. The more time you spend in bed, the lighter your sleep will get. The more used to being awake you'll become in bed. And we'll get more into that in a moment. I talked about the timing of sleep. This is important for you to understand. We're land-based animals. We've got excellent color vision. We have lousy night vision. All, everything that's land-based has to do with the fact that the sun comes and goes. Very classic example. Hundreds of years ago, they saw these plants that open in the daytime and close at night, right? You've seen these plants open in the daytime, close at night. At night, they protect their leaves. Daytime, they open up their leaves. I have 20 minutes or ten, two minutes. What does it say? Five? Okay. Thank you. So the idea behind this is open and close. What happens is all land-based animals must deal with the sun coming and going, okay? We're no different, okay? We have excellent color vision. In our clock, in our brain, there's a little part of tissue that measures time. In our brains, there's a little bit of tissue that measures time. It's our biological clock. And where's the clock located? The perfect spot. If you're going to put a clock in somebody's head, where are you going to put it? Behind the eyes. Behind your eyeballs, where the optic nerves cross, is a little cluster of neurons that measures time. Okay? And what that's trying to do is predict sun up and sun down. If we were hunters and gatherers for real at one point in our lives, you needed to leave the safety of the village to go hunt, you had to get back before it got dark. When dealing with a planet where the days and nights get longer and shorter, Human sleep was probably seasonal to begin with, okay? We, if your friends in Alaska, they'll tell you they sleep more in the winter, less in the summer, right? We should take advantage of the days and hide away at night. So you need a system in your brain to do that. So it turns out that for all of us, we have two times a day we get drowsy, two times a day we get sleepy. All of us get drowsy after lunch. We say, oh, it's lunch made me sleepy. No, that's not true. Breakfast doesn't make you sleepy. Why would lunch make you sleepy? It's the time of the day. Okay? And after dinner, you actually get a second wind. All humans are most alert in the evening than any other time. Okay? If it is true that sleeping is dangerous, when should you be most alert before you go to sleep? So we get the second wind in the evening. Okay? But if you have chronic pain issues, you say, I'm going to go rest, I'm going to go to my bed earlier, you're now going to bed too early when the brain expects you to be awake and you're swimming upstream. And that's why your, your sleeping pills won't work because you're taking the pills too early. The right approach when I have somebody with sleep problems, I want you to go to bed later. I have a patient who tells me that they don't sleep well. They go, I go to bed at 9 o'clock, I take my medication, I wait an hour before it kicks in, and then, 
depending on how it's going, I might take a second one or not, I'm not sure, and then I fall asleep around 11 o'clock, and then I toss and turn, and then I get up in the morning at 6. I'm like, okay, well, you're going to bed at 9. I want you to go to bed at 11 o'clock now, I tell them. And they say, I can't stay up that late. I say, yes, you can. You have insomnia. You can stay up later, okay? <laughs> but the whole idea behind this is to go to bed later. If you, the, 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 simple, the simple reality about sleep is the more logical you are in your approach to your sleep, you're gonna, the more you're going to screw it up. Okay? Sleeping is counterintuitive. Logic would be for us not to sleep. In Silicon Valley, if they ever invent a, a machine to replace humans, that machine, they're not going to make it sleep. Right? Who wants a robot that's sleeping? Right? So the more logical you are, the more analytical you are, the more you're going to screw up your sleep. The reality is that we have been taught how to sleep. That example earlier, I talked about bed partners. Okay? If you've got a bed partner, you've got your side of the bed, your partner has their side of the bed. You ever switch sides? No. Right? You don't switch sides. Okay? The only time, over, the only time people switch sides is when they get older and they have an agreement that one of them has to get up to the bathroom, and then whoever's close to the bathroom when they're in a hotel, that's the only time they ever switch sides because they want to walk around the bed. Other than that, you don't switch sides. All right? You don't switch sides. Your kids know when to find you. Okay? <laughs> they know which side you're on. And if you sleep alone, don't believe me. Rotate your body and put your feet where your pillow normally goes. See what happens tonight. You may fall out of bed, okay? Because we are taught how to sleep, and you've learned to sleep a certain way. If you can walk and talk and smile and laugh, you should be able to sleep just fine. The wiring for sleep is intact. You may have chronic back problems, okay? And, and, but that should not stop you from being able to sleep better. Pain will wake you up, of course. But what happens is once you start to worry about the sleeping, it becomes an issue of itself. So what you want to try to do is improve your sleep as much as we can. And if we improve your sleep also, you may be more tolerant to pain, because when people don't sleep well, they get irritable and cranky and not fun to be around. So we've only got a couple of minutes. These are some of the behavioral things that we do with anybody who has sleep problems. We can help, we can self-correct your sleep. If we can manipulate anybody with sleep problems, the amount of the social interactions, exercise, light, and food. If you do these four things at the same time every day, your sleep will self-regulate. People who have sleeping problems say, I'll get any sleep I can anytime I want to, right? If you were to do that, it's going to just throw off your rhythm. And I'm running out of time, so I can't get into this. But I always want you to take a moment to think about what is the motivation to go to bed? You look, are you going to bed to escape your world? Are you going to bed because you're hoping to sleep better? Or are you going to bed because you're looking forward to tomorrow? It really depends a lot on how you feel about these things. So anyway, we don't have any uh, out of time. And thank you so much for listening.